Good morning, Restoration Church. All right, my name is Chloe Depre, and I'm so excited for the opportunity to preach today. One thing I love about Restoration is how supportive they are of the next generation and how they give us all these opportunities to grow and learn about the dreams that God has placed on our hearts. So before we begin today, I would like to say a huge thank you to all the staff members who have worked so hard to make today possible. Can we give them a round of applause? Hi, my name is Charlie and I'm 12 years old and I'm super excited to preach today. Um, my name is Emma Panabecker. I'm from the Milton location and I'm so excited to talk to you guys today. I'm Owen. Uh, I've been coming to Restoration Church for a little over a year and I'm just like the three of them said, wicked excited to be preaching today. Good, mor good morning to the people watching online, Milton, Plymouth, and Bethlehem. My name is Abram Gagney. Let's hop into the sermon. When I was in seventh grade LA, our teacher had, was, had surgery and was gone for a long time. We had one sub who was mean. We needed our LA teacher back so we'd be saved from our sub. <laughs> it's like this scripture, Romans 8, 19. For all creation is waiting eagerly for the future day when God will view who his children really are. Today we're talking about expecting his return. If we can grab our Bibles and open up to Matthew, Matthew chapter 25, we're going to start right at the beginning at verse 1. We're going to go all the way to 13. Um, but in the New Testament, in the New Testament, we can see so many parables that Jesus taught to get his message across. And a parable is a fictional story with a spiritual meaning. In this passage of scripture, Jesus is talking about expecting his return. The scripture is basically asking us to check ourselves are we like the five unprepared bridesmaids or the five prepared bridesmaids? And as Charlie reads these verses, ask yourself, which one are you like? Let's read chapter 25, starting in verse 1. Then the kingdom of heaven will be like ten bridesmaids who took their lamps and went to meet the bridegroom. Five of them were foolish and five were wise. The five who were foolish didn't take enough olive oil for their lamps, but the other five were wise enough to take along extra oil. When the bridegroom was delayed, they all became drowsy and fell asleep. At midnight, they were roused by the shout, Look, the bridegroom is coming. Come out and meet him. All the bridesmaids got up and prepared their lamps. Then the five foolish ones asked the others, Please give us some of your oil, because our lamps are going out. But the others replied, We don't have enough for all of us. Go to a shop and buy some for yourselves. But while they were gone to buy oil, the bridegroom came. Then those who were ready went in with him to the marriage feast, and the door was locked. Later, when the other five bridesmaids returned, they stood out outside calling, Lord, Lord, open the door for us. But he called back, Believe me, I don't know you. So you too must keep watch, for you do not know the day or hour of my return. Okay, it's really important that you guys know that this scripture is not talking about Christians and non-Christians. When Jesus was telling this parable, he was telling it to a group of Christians. There are those in this church who are expecting and are those who are ready for his return and those who aren't. Why did Jesus tell this parable? He told this parable because he is coming back and Jesus was trying to help us understand this. This parable can be summed up in the last verse. Look again at Matthew 25, 13. It says, therefore keep watch because you do not know the day or the hour. We don't know when Jesus will come back, um, but we must be looking for him to come back. Okay, so I'm gonna tell a quick story about when I was eight years old. So when I was eight, my parents told me and my brother that we would be going to Disney World for the first time. And we, we were Disney kids. We were your stereotypical Disney kids. We grew up on Mickey Mouse Clubhouse and the princess movies and Lion King and whatnot. And so finding this out, we were super excited. Um, but with finding out, there was one problem, which was we found out in March that we would be going in July. So there was this huge waiting period between when we found out we would be going versus when we would actually go. So the closer it got to July and the date that we would actually go, the harder it was to wait. Because, you know, I had waited all this time already. And the closer you get to something, you know, you're all like on the edge of your seat. And you're like, I just wish 
it could be that time already. And so the week of, I remember I could not sleep hardly at all that night because I was just so excited. And we were going to go to Florida and do like a fun, a little but other cool things. So just the week before we left, I was so excited. And eventually it came to the time where I would be going to Disney World. And it was so worth the wait and so much better than what I expected. And when you're expecting something, you look for it. Whether it's a family trip, an Amazon package, or a guest, we are always looking for what we are expecting. And maybe you're one who's felt like you don't want Jesus to return because you want to have, you have hopes and dreams for your life on earth, like getting married, having children, going to college, and traveling the world. And we feel guilty for wanting those things, but it's okay to want those things and wanting a life. But no matter what, everything is going to go according to God's plan, and we have to be ready for that. And another reason we might not want Jesus to return is because we think it might not be as good as we hoped it would be. But, it, but Jesus' return is everything we thought it would be and so much more. Now, a question to ask yourself right now is, are you looking for his return or are you looking for oil? Let's talk about looking for his return first. In the parable, it tells us on verse 6 that someone shouted out the, bri the bridegroom was coming. They got a sign that that bridegroom was coming. The Bible tells us there are signs of his return. What are some of those signs, you may ask? Billy Graham once said, the Bible tells us that the state of the world will grow darker as we near the end of the age. This means that the world will get more evil. One place in the Bible Billy Graham could have found this is 2 Timothy 3.13. It says, but evil people and imposters will flourish. They will deceive others and will themselves be deceived. In the Bible, it also says that nations will rise against nations and kingdoms against kingdoms. There will be famines and earthquakes in various places. Matthew 24, 7. Nations will rise against nations means that nations will go to war. Another sign in the Bible that needs to happen for Jesus to come back, it, it says, and this gospel of the kingdom will be preached in the whole world as a testimony to all nations, and then the end will come. Matthew 24, 14. This sign shows that when everyone has heard the gospel, then he will be able to return. These are not the only things that need to happen. There are more signs. It's possible you haven't been looking for his return. You haven't seen the signs, but this is going to leave you looking for oil when he comes back. The oil in the story represents the anointing of the Holy Spirit. So in the story, when the um, wise bridesmaids grabbed the oil for their lamps, that meant they wanted the Holy Spirit in them, and they wanted to be, um, they uh, wanted to be faithful, and they wanted to listen to God. And the foolish ones didn't grab the oil because they didn't want the anointing of the Holy Spirit in, in him, them, and they didn't. They thought they could do it on their own, and it didn't end out well for them, did they? Because they woke up and they didn't have oil for their lamps, and they ha they asked and they for oil and the wise bridesmaids didn't give them oil because they didn't have any to spare and so you you don't want to be the ones that aren't prepared like the foolish ones you want to be the ones that are prepared and are faithful um like the wise ones now church we may be working eating sleeping entertaining ourselves whatever it is we must be doing it in such a way that we don't have to go look for oil we don't have to make things right with god like people tell that to themselves oh i have time i have time he's not coming back for a while but it is in the bible that we do not know it is according to god's plan that he's going to come back when he comes back so whatever it is that we are doing church, we need to be doing it in a way that will glorify him, that will allow us to be expecting him. And something big that this parable is talking about is how you can't borrow someone else's faith. When the five foolish bridesmaids asked for oil, it's like they were asking for more faith. But the five wise bridesmaids knew that faith can't be given away. So they gave advice, like when they told the foolish bridesmaids to go buy oil. The five wise bridesmaids that brought extra oil were those who had a relationship with God. And the non-wise bridesmaids who asked for more oil were those who were like, okay, well, I'm Christian, but I don't need to go to church today. I'm too tired. Or I'm Christian, but I don't need to read the Bible. That's a bunch of nonsense, you know? So when it came time for um, the bridegroom to return, they weren't ready and they didn't have enough oil. 
and so they asked if they could have some more. But like she said, you can't donate faith. It's like if you were going into a math test and you asked like, oh, I didn't study, I don't know how to do this, can I borrow your brain? It's not how it works. <laughs> Now, we must be wise just like them. The, the wise ones had enough oil in their lamps to wait out the night, enjoy the bridegroom. They were able to wait out the long period until midnight, right? And for us to be wise, we need to prepare, prepare our minds and be ready for the salvation that Jesus has for us. In 1 Peter 1 through 13, it says, so prepare your minds for action and exercise self-control. Put all your hope in the gracious salvation that will come to you when Jesus Christ is revealed to the world. Just like in that verse, if our minds are prepared, our minds are exercising that self-control, telling the devil, no, I am going to go to church. I might be tired. I might be getting there at 7.30s when I got here. It, but <laughs> it doesn't matter. We need to be doing everything we can to glorify him because that prepares, oh, whoa, that prepares us and that makes us expectant that he's going to come when he does. And church, if we are forgetful, if we are like the foolish ones, I don't have to go. I don't have to go on that Sunday. That's for next gen. That's just a bunch of kids. I, I'm okay. I'll wait till Nate's back up, right? If we keep saying that, our minds are going to get so full of sin, so full of those lies that the devil has for us, that we're not going to see the gracious salvation that he has. It's not going to be a gracious salvation. It's going to be a judgment day. And it's still a judgment day for Christians, but regardless, you got the point. We need to be, we just, we need to be prepared for what he has for us. The five wise wise men were really prepared for the celebration because they grabbed oil for their lamps and they already had the faith with them. And um, when the bridegroom showed up, they went with him into the party. But the other foolish bridesmaids had a lack of preparation because they didn't grab the oil. They didn't, they didn't grab their faith because they didn't want to have any faith. And when they left, it's like they were just asking to get faith only when he came, not when he wasn't. Um, and when they came back, they saw the party um, had started, but the doors were slammed shut and locked. Um, and they asked to come into the party, but he said no, no, he didn't know who they were. There is no need for us to expect to be locked out. Instead, looking and prepare for Jesus to return. We are expecting a party. When it comes time for the party, are we going to be locked out of the room or inside of the room? Let me ask you a question. If you knew for a fact that tomorrow morning, 7 a.m. 7 a.m. sharp, Jesus would return, what in your life would you change today? And really, really listen to this part. What would you change today if you knew he'd be returning tomorrow? This is important. Because, and I hope that the answer would be nothing. And you may be wondering, okay, well, why is that? And it's because the Bible makes it really easy for us. It lays out the Christian lifestyle and the Christian faith and the things that you do when you're a Christian. And if the people are like, okay, you don't have to be a big shot Christian to make it to heaven. You don't have to be in some evangelist or some missionary. You don't, ha don't have to be a pastor or a worship leader. You can just be a simple person who goes to church to love God. And that's okay because what matters is your relationship with him. And a way I would visualize this parable is by using this analogy. Because there's a group of people who had a ticket to go on a cruise. And, the, and that group of people, they're going to the cruise and they arrive ahead of time. So they're prepared. And another group of people, they got a little behind schedule. And when they get there, the cruise is already leaving and they couldn't get on. But when the people who were prepared got on, the first group of people were like the five wise bridesmaids because they were prepared. And the second group of people were like the five foolish bridesmaids because they didn't make it on time. But this really happens. And I would like to show you a 15 second video that recently went viral. My booking number is four. V as in Victor, G as in George, Q as in Quick, X as in X-ray, Q as in Quick. Yikes. <laughs> but we have to be waiting and expecting because it is so easy to be led astray by something that at the time seems more attractive, like living a sinful life and saying you'll give your life to Jesus right before you die or right before he comes back. 
but you don't know when you're going to die, and you don't know when he's going to come back. So just give your life to him now. And we can only be so prepared because we don't know the future. And we can only be as prepared as we allow God to make us. And C.S. Lewis said, if you live for the next world, you get this one in the deal. But if you live for only this world, you lose them both. Think about this in your head. Are you the wise bridesmaids or are you the foolish ones? Are you the heartfelt bridesmaids or are you the hypocrites? Are you the ones that are running towards God or are you the ones running away? Ask yourself these three questions. The first one is, are we making empty promises with God? And when I was writing my part of the sermon, I wrote, are we making empty promises with God? But better yet, are we making promises with God, period? I would like to begin this first question by reading Ecclesiastes chapter 5, verse 5. It says, it is better not to promise anything than to promise something and not do it. A second one is Ecclesiastes chapter 5, verse 7. It says, many useless promises are like so many dreams. They mean nothing. You should respect God. Are we making promises with God that we can't fulfill? So maybe you sound like this. You're like, God, I fell into that sin again. I know you've already forgiven me, so I promise I'll never do it again. But how many of us know that the power doesn't come from within us? It comes from within God. So you could fix it, your prayer and make it sound, God, I've, I've sinned again and I've fallen short to the temptation. I pray for your forgiveness and I pray next time I'm faced with this temptation that you'll give me the strength and guidance to push through and persevere because making a promise to God is as weak as my brother's riz, okay? I was... <laughs> so the second question is, am I truly... <laughs> Guys, I might... He's gonna kill me. <laughs> am I truly making... <laughs> Am I truly making an effort for my relationship with God? I'd like to read to you Matthew chapter 7, verses 22 to 23. It says, On that day, many will say to me, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and cast out demons in your name and do many mighty works in your name? And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you workers of lawlessness. And that's, that can be a pretty scary thing. But we don't have to be afraid. Because if we know that we have the relationship with God, and we know that we're pushing with the relationship with God, and we're sharing Him, and we have a real relationship with Him, and He knows us, and we know Him, we're safe. The final question I'm not going to expand on, i just like you to think about it, is am I twisting what God is saying for selfish reasons? And it seems like these verses are telling us to be prepared. But how prepared can we be if we don't know what's happening? But the whole point is to live your life in Christ because you don't know. You don't know when he'll return. We don't know God's plan, so we can't map out our own. Because so many things are gonna happen and we won't know the exact conditions of the world because we can't see the future. But God knows the future and he is prepared. In this message today, we talked about Jesus' return. The thing I want you to leave with today is to be, to be prepared for Jesus' return. I have three, three categories of people I want to pray for today. The first category is if you've never given your life to Jesus and you want to give your life to Him, pray this prayer with me. Dear Jesus, today I accept you as my Savior. I believe that you exist and you can forgive all my sins. Amen. And the second category of people is the people who just go to church. What I mean by this is that you go to church and that's how far your relationship with, goes with Jesus. If, you pr if that's you, pray this prayer. Dear Jesus, I ask for your forgiveness for not being ready. Will you help me prepare? Help me not just look for you on Sundays, but look for you every day. And the third category of people are the people who are ready. If you are ready, pray this prayer with me. Dear Jesus, I'm so excited for you to come back. I don't know when you're going to come back, but I'm so excited for the party you've planned. Amen. Amen. All right, church. It's Nate told me to do some closing thoughts, so just, this is wicked cool. Um, the lights are a lot brighter, so I can't see as many of you, which definitely helped 
me being nervous. So that, I don't know if that was for all of us, but that's what I was thinking. I was like, okay, we're good. But so I'm going to pray and then I'm going to welcome Pastor Nate for uh, communion. Dear Jesus, thank you so much for allowing the five, five of us to just preach your word today. Thank you for using us as your ambassadors and just speaking your word to this to these people today, God. Lord, I pray that if anyone prayed one of Abram's prayers, that they go to the Welcome Center, they talk about it, they're joyful, especially if someone just gave their life today, Jesus. Lord, they are gonna start expecting all the great things you have for them, and they're gonna be so ready for when you return. Lord, thank you so much for today and for everything else that you have for this church and for us. In Jesus' name, amen. I was lost, I was a slave, I was unwanted, still you came, I was dirty, you washed my feet. You looked in my eyes, said it's okay. I can relax in your presence. I can ask for forgiveness. I can talk to you I can pray to you I was lost I was a slave I was unwanted Okay. 